welcome everyone to our service today, particularly if you're watching us online, it's great to have you with us as well, and any visitors we have here today particularly are especially welcome, who I can see from here, welcome. Uh, it should have been Phil leading this morning, but unfortunately he has a, a very bad cough, so he didn't want to pass it on to anybody, so you're putting up with me this morning, but great to be with you. Let's have a moment's quiet and then I'll pray and then we'll move on into our service together. Loving Father, as we begin, in a sense, a new series, a new year, we just pray that we may move on with you in everything we do. Lord, help us to trust you day by day to teach us, to guard us, to guide us. And help us to, as we learn from you, to share that learning and that love with others whom we meet. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing two songs. One, in a sense, the opposite way round to the way we may see them in life as we read the scriptures. We Three Kings, because that's very much the focus of our service this morning. And then see him lying on a bed of straw, reminding us of how when Jesus came, he was a very humble child to serve us and to lead us through life. So if you're able to, please do stand. Thank you. 
to see the Lord of love again. Just as poor as was the stable there, the Prince of Glory really came. Oh, silver sweep across the skies, show where Jesus in the nature lies. Shepherds swiftly from the super rise to see the Savior.
Please do sit down. Uh, before I come to a, an important part of our service, I wanted to share some notices with you. Um, it's a long commercial slot, this one. The first one is a strange one, it may appear, but one that is very important. On the counter in the lounge are three boxes of long orange vegetables called carrots. <laughs> now, for some unknown reason, we can never tell at the food bank what we're going to receive from uh, Tesco's. And this last Thursday, we were inundated with carrots, and that's just putting it mildly. Um, as Craig will tell you, and Ray will. Sorry? 350 bags. Not many, is it? You know. We managed to get rid of quite a lot, but <laughs> there are still many. So out on the counter there, there are boxes of carrots, which you might put a, if you're very good, make into soup. You might like to eat raw. You might like to just uh, look at. <laughs> you decide what you want to do. But please, if you possibly can take some for you, for your neighbours, that would be absolutely wonderful. So that's first. The second is, whilst, just to stop you sort of forgetting that, the refreshments are just past the carrots. So you can't miss them as you're going out there. And down beside the carrots, there is a big plastic bag with other plastic bags inside it. So if you're worried about, you know, taking them home, there's your answer. Right, now I'll go on. On Saturday afternoon, if you have any young people, and even yourselves, if you're young at heart, as some people are here particularly, um, there is a pantomime on at the New Morden Baptist Church. There is an advert about it on the, uh, in the lounge. Looks like this, Jack and the Beanstalk, they're putting on on Saturday afternoon. It is free, they're just asking for donations for a hospital out in, I think it's in, uh, in U Ukraine. Nearly there. Now, over the last years, not so much recently, we were involved in providing shelter for the homeless during the cold period of the year. And we were a host church for that uh, during that period of time on one night during the week. They're changing the pattern this year and they're going to have a central um, place where the homeless can come, registered and uh, spend the night, have a hot meal, hot breakfast, as well as somewhere to sleep. And they're doing a training session on Wednesday and Thursday of this coming week. It's a bit short notice, I recognise, but if you are interested, even if you can't get to one of those training sessions, if you see me and I will carry your name forward and... Uh, Make sure that they get in touch with you. I'm going down on Thursday of this week to that. And the last notice that I have down here on this particular section is to say that next Sunday we have our lunch, the first of our New Year lunches together. So if you're able to come, you're very welcome. If you can bring something to share, great. If not, just come. The main thing is to have people there, have a chance to chat together, get to know each other a bit more. So that'll be after the service next Sunday. Now, as I indicated, we have at least two visitors with us today who don't regularly come to the church here. One who was definitely a regular member, but a few years ago. Um, Peter, who's going to speak to us in a few minutes. I'll come out, Peter. Introduce you. Peter is currently in training for the ministry. He started here as a Quite a small young man, I think we might say, <laughs> and has grown since. So it's great to have him back and to continue over the years to share with him how God has been working in his life. Now, we only have one microphone, Peter, so you'll have to come close here. Now, tell us where, you, where you're training and how's it been going? Yes, thank you, Dave. Um, I'm training at a theological college um, just outside of Oxford called Ripon College Cudston. Um, it's going pretty well. I mean, 
there's both an academic side to it. Um, so I'm taking a course with the University of Oxford at the moment, and um, I'm getting quite a lot out of that, learning quite a lot. Um, but also um, various college jobs, such as helping out with uh, leading the youth work with other students' children, um, jobs relating to, to the chapel, um, treasure being the treasurer for the common room has been one of the other things that I've done. Um, involvement with, with the music there. Um, so there's been a range of activities which have been very helpful and very formational um, to me. Great. Now, life is going to change quite dramatically in your training in the coming months. Um, you won't be spending it in the Chilterns or the Highlands of Scotland. I think you're going somewhere a little, a little warmer, hopefully. Want to tell us a bit about that? Yes, I'm going to Barbados. <laughs> there were almost groans of envy there, weren't there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, why Barbados and what are you going to be doing there? Um, so my college, uh, Ripon College Cudston, has an exchange agreement with uh, Codrington College uh, in Barbados. Um, so Codrington College is um, a training college for Anglican clergy. And most of the people who, um, who train there are from around the Caribbean, uh, around a number of the different islands there. Um, it's, it's helpful to gain um, experience of Anglicanism in another province. Um, and it's helpful to... It's, it's, it's an experience which, which broadens one's horizons to see how um, things work in, in the churches in, in a different... Uh, place and, and and just a very helpful um, cultural experience and there should be the opportunity to engage with worship with with those training there um, and also possibly to to attend um, some, well most probably to attend some of the classes um, that happen there um, yeah so it, it should be a very um, enriching service and hopefully uh, they can help contribute to my own formation as a minister and Hopefully, I'll be able to, to contribute to the life of that college and um, to the people uh, whom I meet there. Thanks, Peter. Now, you haven't come alone this morning, I know. Um, so, I'm going to ask you now what we can pray for, for you, um, both personally and maybe in a wider field. And it may involve the person who's sitting a few rows back. Yeah. So, if you want to share something on that. And then, then invite anyone who wants to come up and... Uh, Lay hands on Peter and pray for him, for his future. Uh, yes, so I've come today with my fiance Beth. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was embarrassing. Isn't it? <laughs> um, we will be apart from each. We're not. So I'm. I'm going to Barbados for two months. Luckily, we won't be apart from each other for the whole of those two months. Um, as she's coming out in the February half term, she's a secondary school teacher. She's coming out in the second uh, in the um, in the February half term to visit me for a week, uh, so that's nice. But um, we will definitely both miss each other um, very much. So um, uh, I, I'm obviously going to make sure that I'm I'm in regular contact with her. <laughs> um, but yes, praying that I'll be able to that we'll be able to cope without um, each other's company because um, we'll miss each other very much. Um, I think also, uh, you know, a, a lot of people when they, when they find out, wh whenever I mention uh, going to Barbados, they think, oh, you know, you're very lucky, that's absolutely great. And yeah, I am, I am very lucky to have this opportunity to go to Barbados. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it is quite an adjustment. Um, you know, I haven't done as much traveling as other people have. Um, and and psychologically, it, it can, it can, you wonder how things will work and, and you have worries about um, what life will be like there. So um, I, th I think very much prayers for, for settling in and being able to adjust and adapt um, to life there. Thank you. So if anyone would like to come out and we'll just lay hands on Peter and pray for him, for both for this time in Barbados and also for his future training for the ministry and where God will lead him. So feel free to come. And you don't have to pray if you come, but it's um, just a sign of our, our love for you, brother. Yeah, try standing in the middle. Yeah, you? I just want to come out in the middle. Speak loudly, but... Um,
Amen. Now we're going to sing again, and this song, Light of the World, and then after that, Janine's going to come and read us, read to us from Matthew 2, and then Peter will come and share with us then. So if you're able to... Please do stand.
please do sit down. Good morning. The reading is from Matthew chapter 2, The Visit of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem <clears throat> and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may too go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was, was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophet, he will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for that reading, Janine. Well, it's been um, a very interesting week, and I think had I sat down last night to prepare this sermon, I would have delivered a somewhat different sermon from what I've preferred here. Um, I wonder if any of you have been watching uh, the recent ITV drama, Mr. Bates versus the Post Office. A lot of people uh, have been talking about that recently, 
Uh, it's a, about a post office scandal that uh, went on for six, 15, 16 years um, from about 1999 till 2015. Um, and it was to do with uh, a faulty system, accounting software, uh, um, employed by uh, the electronics company Fujitsu in post offices. Um, and it made it look like postmasters um, had been uh, taking money from the post office. Um, and it, it's one of the worst miscarriages of justice in, in British history. A number of post office masters uh, uh, were prosecuted. Um, some even took their own lives. Um, and a number of them have died without seeing uh, much uh, justice being done. Now, why do I talk about the post office scandal um, in this in relation to the passage which we've read from. Well, uh, we're coming on to a new sermon series uh, over, over the next few weeks, and this is the first one of those sermon series. Uh, it's about outsiders coming to God, um, and it's, it's well arranged that this sermon uh, is on the wise men, because this week, or strictly speaking yesterday, but it's often transferred to Sunday, is uh, the Feast of Epiphany, uh, which celebrates when the wise men, or magi, came to visit Jesus. And I suppose if I was focusing in, in my sermon more on um, bringing this into dialogue with what has happened with the post office, I'd want to draw a contrast between the post office and Jesus um, in the sense that there were no stately scenes of majesty for the King of Kings when he received his gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense from the wise men. He didn't demand it, he was simply a baby receiving it. And yet the post office demanded money from those who served all their lives for the post office. And it was money which didn't belong to them. It was money which was being taken from people who, who didn't owe that money. Um, and so it's quite a contrast to, to look at that. And I suppose there would probably be um, a message of Resurrection. I know we're not yet at Easter, but it's, it's unfortunate that justice is, is so slowly being employed um, or realized by those affected uh, in, in this post office scandal. Um, there have been a lot of quashing of, of, of criminal convictions so that um, people who were convicted um, no longer have a criminal record. Um, and it was interesting seeing the scenes um, in, in, in the later episodes of, of, of Mr. Bates versus the post office because there was such joy when their innocence was being upheld by the courts. Now, I mentioned that it's epiphany, um, and it's, it's been an interesting week in other ways because... I, I went to Southwark Cathedral, our, our diocesan cathedral, on Friday for an epiphany party, and, and lots of people who were involved in different ways with vocations in the diocese were there. Um, and it, it was very good to, to speak to a number of people, to attend uh, Evensong there. Um, I, I was able to speak to our bishop, the Bishop of Kingston. I hadn't met him before. Um, and. Um, yeah, it, 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 was, it, was a, it was a special experience. And um, yesterday was also quite interesting. Um, Beth and I were invited to have supper with uh, the Bishop of Southwark, our, our diocesan bishop. Um, in the end, we ended up, um, well, bishop, bishop Christopher ended up receiving an invitation from the Armenian Orthodox Church, um, fr from, from, their bishop, from the bishop of the Armenian Orthodox Church in the UK and Ireland, Bishop Hovakim, and we ended up going um, to a, a reception to celebrate their Christmas. Their Christmas in their calendar was being celebrated yesterday, um, and that was in Brentford. Um, it, it was a very interesting experience being able to meet um, the, uh, the bishop. Um, he's also an Arsenal fan like me, so <laughs> that was quite nice to learn. <laughs> um, and we, we talked a bit about that, but also to meet some young uh, Armenian Orthodox people. And also uh, the Armenian ambassador was there, and uh, it, it was a great privilege to meet him. Um, and, and so um, the bishop does send his greetings to everyone here. Um, and um, 
Yes, he's very much praying for everyone here as, as he is um, for everyone else um, in this diocese at the moment. Um, so yes, that's, that's really all I, all I wanted to say um, about the last um, week or so. Um, I'll now move on to, to what I prepared, but before I uh, do, uh, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want you to imagine a mountain, uh, not a particularly tall mountain, uh, but one with a number of different ways to the top. Some may think that this expresses the relationship between different religions, that there are a number of religions and that each are a different way to God. And so many, even some Christians will say, but don't all religions lead to God? Why do I mention this? Well, in our passage we have the Magi or the wise men. And they most likely were not Jewish. Some have said they were Zoroastrian priests. Zoroastrianism is a religion that still exists in among the world's population today. Rather than believing in an all-powerful good God, Zoroastrians are dualists, believing in two equal forces of good and evil in eternal conflict with one another. Yet the wise men came to worship Jesus, bringing gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense. Someone who is very close to me, not my mum or my dad, or anyone who attends this church, takes the view that other religions are satanic. But I think there is a danger in polarizing all other religions as false with Christianity. Just because, say, Islam or Buddhism disagree with certain aspects of the Christian faith and do not acknowledge Jesus as Lord, does not mean that they are completely wrong. The friend whom I refer to uh, believes that people of all other religions are going to hell because they don't believe that Jesus is God. He believes that the similarities which other religions have to Christianity are a trick used by the devil to make them look more accurate and to keep them from finding God and going to heaven when they die. On the other hand, as we learn from the letter of James, empty belief is not enough. For example, in James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Many Christians were certainly not worshipping the God of Christianity during the time of the Crusades. I believe that God has been working in the world since the beginning of time throughout the cosmos, and this is supported by the biblical teaching that God is omnipresent or present everywhere in creation. As the angels sing in Isaiah 6.3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Are we to suggest that God did not interact with the generation of religious texts other than the Bible? Was his omnipresence simply passive whilst other religions' texts were being written? We see the principle of God's work beyond the Jewish people in the Old Testament, in Amos 9, 7. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Arameans from Kir? He may therefore have revealed himself in and through other religions. Now, that is not to say that a Muslim or a Hindu is correct to deny that Jesus is the Son of God. We must acknowledge that, despite certain errors within non-Christian teachings, other religions contain much truth in them. 
When we answer, for example, the question of whether, of whether Christians and Muslims worship the same God, the answer is yes and no. Yes, both worship the God of Abraham. No, because Muslims do not worship Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They do not worship the triune God. But as the Bible teaches, we are all made in the image of God. And Muslims, Hindus and others may have perceived God in many ways throughout history. Their sacred texts reveal much, may reveal much about God, for they were written by people who were created by God and made in his image. That is not to say that every religious person worships God in spirit and truth. It is to say that we can't put other people and religions in a box and that the world isn't as black and white as people like to make out. I'm not saying that by being a Muslim or Hindu, one is saved. And I do not deny that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. In whatever way those following other religions are worshipping God, if non-Christians are to be saved and received into the kingdom of heaven, they would be saved through the death and resurrection of Christ. For all the value in other religions, Jesus is the unique bearer of salvation. The wise men or magi or free kings were outsiders and yet these men recognized that God had become incarnate. Mary and Joseph modeled a hospitable holiness by allowing them to come to worship the newborn king. The villain in this story is King Herod. For all his terrible failures and evil in the story, Herod is to be praised for listening to the wise men. The problem was, his reaction to what he heard and the unspeakable evil of doing anything to keep himself in power by killing babies. We learn from Herod and Mary and Joseph that we are to listen to people from different religious and cultural backgrounds and we are to learn from them. This listening is one of the principles behind a practice called scriptural reasoning. Um, an interreligious practice where Christians, Muslims and Jews read one another's sacred texts in formal meetings and comment upon them to one another. One's perspective of one's own faith is enriched by viewing it through the eyes of someone from a different religion. It was popular, scriptural reasoning that is, it was popular in Cambridge from where it originated and perhaps more needs to be done to popularise the practice throughout the Church of England. I want to return to the Bible, though. The story of non-Jewish kings is not limited to Jesus' birth. In Genesis 14, 18, there is the king of Salem, Melchizedek, the non-Jewish priest of God Most High, who brings out bread and wine and whom Abraham meets. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus is described as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Such was the non-Jew Melchizedek's godliness. Similarly, some theologians believe that belief in the Israelite God originated from the land of Midian, where Moses' father-in-law, Jephro, lived. In the early chapters of Exodus, when Moses left Egypt, he temporarily went to the land of Midian and ended up marrying Zipporah, who was the daughter of the high priest of Midian. Ancient Israelite politics owed much to Jephro, as he gave Moses valuable advice in Exodus chapter 18 about judging different cases for the Israelites. Throughout the history of the church, Christian teaching has engaged with Greek philosophy, with Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, it was the German atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who described Christianity as Platonism for the people. Such were the similarities he saw between the writings of Plato and the Christian message. But it also points to the earlier truth which I mentioned, that we are all made in the image of God, that the teachings of all philosophies and religions reflect truths that 
all men and women can know without special revelation from God through sacred texts. These things can be known through reason, through reflecting, using one's mind, and through engaging with the natural world. If I were to say the word grace, I wonder what you would think. Do you think of being saved through the grace of God? Jesus' death and resurrection is that grace saves us from death and reconciles us with God. We often refer to God's grace as the gift we do not deserve. But if I were to use the term known as common grace, I am referring to a grace which works beyond the boundaries of the church, to a morality which anyone can know without being a Christian, to truths which one can live by even without believing in God or the Christian God, to things which do not need to be supernaturally revealed by God. Many atheists and agnostics may not believe in God, but they still have a strong sense of right and wrong, and their beliefs about what are right and wrong do not differ considerably from those within the church. Such an idea can be found in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. See verses 14 to 15. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. The Magi may not have been Christian, they may not have been Jewish, but they had awareness of God, the image of God which lived within them and had revealed God to them, pointed them towards Jesus, the light of the world. But what does the message of the star mean for us as a church? as we look to embrace outsiders. Jesus in Matthew 5, 14 to 16 said, You are the light of the world, a city built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And similarly, St. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold the word of life. The wise men were able to find Jesus because of that light which shone so brightly in the sky. They were able to recognize that that light was from God because of the image in which both this world and they were made. May we, as God's people, as brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, shine like stars so that people in this world, people made in God's image, may see God in his church and come to recognize that he became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth and worship him. And may they be transformed and seek to spread that transformation and light of Christ to all those whom they will encounter. Amen. Thank you, Peter. We're going to sing a song that Peter has particularly asked us to uh, include in the service, which fits very much, obviously, on what his message has been today. And so it's, the words at the beginning are, Christ be our light, that he indeed may be the one on whom we focus and through who works through us in the world in which we live. So if our singers like to come up.
And if you're able to, please stand as we join together in singing this song. And then following this, Jenny's going to come and lead us in our time of intercessions. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for this new year. We thank you that we have been able to celebrate Christmas when you sent your only son to save us. We thank you for friends and families. We thank you for the many blessings you send us and for being there when we need to speak to you. Amen. Dear Lord God, we are sorry for the times when we do not appreciate you, when we try to go our own way and not yours. Help us to talk to you and read your word and to trust you. Our Father, we pray for our church and our community. We thank you 
that we can meet together and praise you. We pray for those who are ill or sad or worried. Please comfort them and lay your healing hand on them. We pray for our world and our country. We are sorry for the mess we have made of everything. We pray for Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Palestine. Please let these awful wars cease. Let them stop all the bombing and find a peaceful solution. Help all the innocent civilians and also help our country where there's a lot of flooding. Help all the people that are concerned with that. We ask this in Jesus' name. We also pray for our country with all the strikes that are going on. Please protect our National Health Service and help the junior doctors. Please help our government to resolve this situation. We ask this in Jesus' name. And finally, a prayer for peace. Send your peace, peace to this world, peace to this country. Peace for my friends and my community. Peace for my family and my loved ones. And God give us your peace. And then help us to give away. As a peacemaker to our families and our loved ones. As a peacemaker to our friends and community. As a peacemaker for this country. And a peacemaker for this world. In Jesus' name, Amen. And we finish with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. I'm going to sing our final hymn now, Hymn of Heaven. Have we lost Debbie? <laughs> oh, so sorry. You look really worried there for a moment, Yukari. If you're able to, please stand as we sing.
as we stand. So we're going to join in a final prayer that will come up on the screen. Just praying that God will be with us in all we do in these coming days. Just have a look through the words and then we will join together with them. It's in every situation, in every position that we are in, that he is there, that we want him there, and pray that he will be there. So let's join together in these words. Christ, go with us. Christ, go before us. Christ, be behind us. Christ, be in us. Christ, beneath us. Christ, above us. Christ on our right, Christ on our left, and may we show the love of Christ wherever we go and to whoever we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. 